You know, um, I don't know how many miles it is to Des Moines from here, but it's not very far down the road. And every October, there's something called the World Food Prize. Anybody here been to the World Food Prize? A whole bunch of people have. And it it's, uh, was really set up by uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution, and um, brings together a, a lot of very thoughtful and provoking discussions about what we need to do. And, um, you know, last night we heard that uh, from, uh, from David White about that 70% more that has to be produced between now and 2050, and that doesn't sound so big, but when you think about that, 70% more really means producing as much in the next 40 years as we did in the last 10,000. Well, maybe you get a different picture of that. Well, that, that conference has a lot of very interesting speakers, and I think it was uh, three years ago, Howard was one of the speakers, and he came in, and remember, this is a conference on the Green Revolution, with the uh, classic Howard statement of, brown is the new green. And I first thought he had had a falling out with John Deere, but that wasn't, <laughs> was, wasn't what it was. Um, and he was really talking about that before we can have more green, we have to pay attention to brown and the brown revolution. And I know that there's nothing new about that statement for anyone that is in this room. As a matter of fact, for me as a kid who grew up on a, on a farm and uh, uh, you know, a father who um, you know, late in his life uh, turned to no-till and do all those kind of things, it's all very intuitive. But, but I can tell you that for many policymakers, this is not something that's on their mind. And I would even say, even for a company like ourselves, seed and technology company, um, who have many, many people who have farm roots, it isn't the first thing they think of either. So when Howard talked about brown being the new green, it really was um, something that spurred, I think, some new thinking. And I'm going to combine that with a second thought that um, happened at the World Food Prize and many other meetings. And we have lots of discussion on how much more we need to produce, and we need to do it sustainably, and that agriculture already uses 70% uh, of the world's fresh water, and there isn't another 70% to, to increase that uh, production. But what we probably haven't talked about nearly enough is the fact that you know, all of this happens outdoors, and it's going to happen in the context of what will probably be a more volatile climate. As Nancy just talked about, you know, we fear there are more droughts. And not only more droughts, but the role of temperature. And I think uh, uh, th that it maybe you know, isn't so intuitive to all people, but the role of temperature and productivity. There were a lot of stories yesterday about 2012, how different practices, cover crops, higher organic matter, no-till, all looked dramatically different in 2012. We heard the same kind of stories, by the way, about how farmers that had used biotechnology for insect control in 2012, and they were comparing it to what had happened in 1998, the, the most similar kind of situation. So we can see that there are practices and tools that help us better prepare. But the bigger idea that I think comes out to me from all of this is that we have to make the farming system more resilient. And that's the word I heard a number of times yesterday. So we got we to gotta produce more. We got to pay attention to the soil. We have to think about it in a system kind of uh, way, making the, the more system resilient. So we came back really from that World Food Prize as a company and started asking ourselves the question, what should we do in this space? And that's really the, the, the start of what is the uh, soil health partnership today. The first piece, you know, and coming to a meeting like this, it's really obvious. You know, there's so much knowledge and learning of people who have been doing this for years. So anyone to come in and think they should just uh, do something themselves is ludicrous. Uh, and that's why it's a partnership. And we're really a, a funder and collaborator in the partnership. And if you uh, go to the trade show area and you see this brochure, you'll see in the back side all of the partners that are in there. And there's an awful lot of people that are in this room whose names are on the back of this. And we'd like to have more of the people who are in this room have the names on the back of this uh, as advisors, because we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to do something that somebody is already uh, effectively doing. 
What we're aiming to really do, uh, and this is where we, we see our role, is if when I hear people talk about the fundamental challenge, it sounds an awful lot actually what, what a seed and technology company does. We have to figure out how you take all this disparate amount of data from results locally and get it into a comprehensive, practical um, set of information that allows this to go large scale. And, and that's what we see really as our role in doing this and the partnership is really about getting 20 this year, many more longer term after this farm size, um, practical settings with data done in a uniform kind of manner that is comparable. We want to use the uh, calculator from the field to market uh, approach so that we can get a uniform kind of approach. And the reason why I think this is spot on is what strikes me in coming to this meeting is that what we have is a practice that when you hear people who actually use it talk about it is unbelievably compelling economically, environmentally, and they've been doing it for a while. Yet, as an ag economist, that's my formal training, I can't think of anything else that's that compelling on all those things. And it's the right thing to do and isn't widespread. That's the nut that we got to crack, because to make the benefits that were talked about here, when they're done by all of you, that's wonderful. But what we really need as a society is we need this for the landscape effect, and we need it at a planetary kind of level. And that's the kind of commitment that I think uh, that we all have to have to make. And we want this partnership to really be a catalyst and help all of those efforts that, that you've got going to help get to that point. I'm going to close on uh, something that uh, Chad Shipmaker said to me yesterday. Sorry, Chad, I didn't tell you I was going to use that, but um, here it goes. Uh, you know, he said, <laughs> it was actually a very insightful point. And, and the, the, the point basically was, partnership is great. It need, you know, it's a catalyst. Uh, let's let it build on everything else. Don't copy anything else. We're not interested in funding anything else that copies anything else. But what really makes a difference is when companies like yours and your, your colleagues and competitors um, start investing in this for, as, as a business. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think you're seeing signs of that. So you know, take a look at the number of, uh, and look at the program this morning, the number of names from companies. There's interested in doing this. And there's lots of companies that are doing things. I can speak to Monsanto because I know it best. Uh, um, we got to get breeding adapted. Uh, there's, uh, we really think that there's an opportunity with all the data that you own and you collect to turn it into insight to make better decisions. And that's what uh, our integrated farming system investment is all about, adding climate and weather to it to help you make better decisions, and even a partnership that uh, we put together late last year with Novozymes about harnessing uh, the power of, uh, of that soil microbe uh, to make it more efficient. So that I think that investment is starting. And um, we all got to really work together to get this at a planetary level because the planet needs it. Thank you.